My name Nezina Langandi Fuulisani Ravele. And in the Kofando Takalanga Manda, I'm also Uri Ndombelo, Uri Ndipirise, HHP, that I'm back and I'm sure more known. I think some of you are a Zui, a Rari, Mutu, as a DBC Kavatu. Zino Nenga Zina Ndi Fuulisani Ravele. Ndi Mdulu wa Ravele Macheke Cheke. Macheke Cheke, Ola Mbuza Zimabara Ndar Ndi Doni Tabela Koromo. Macheke Cheke, Mine Njami Pupi Ma Adao Dudu Mela. Ndi Mkororo. Dimduru, wa bela la mambo, wa denga, wa macheke cheke watoma, wa ndia miyomba watoma, wa bovele, wa bonganga, wa bondua kuru, wa bondua ya miyomba babili. Lingwe zina ndifu muofe, muofe wa opandala mafumo diru angandote. Ah. Welcome to this second panel. I am so, so excited. Uh, to those that did not have an understanding, I was just simply introducing myself the way that we introduce ourselves, the way that I know and have been raised. My name is Ulisani Ravele. I am a broadcaster. I've been in the entertainment industry for 25 years this year in my little youth. And I am very, very, very excited to be one of the members of the 2030 reading panel. And just to extend a thanks again to the chair and the team who have brought all of us together to really have a conversation that progresses the children of our nation. Education is something I'm very passionate about. And being an entertainer, you're often asked, why do you have a degree? And it's like, no, guys, like there's, there's more, you know, to life to be able to, to achieve to. And so reading is one of those things that for me personally, reading saved my life, kept me out of trouble, kept me off the streets. And not only did we get to a point where it was reading and being able to learn, but getting to the ability where I can read for enjoyment. And I think that's where we all want our young children to be able to get to. So it gives me great pleasure to continue asking the question, who needs to change or what needs to change rather for the 2030 goal to be reached? And in this panel, um, we're going to be joined by, from my far left there, Commissioner Andre Gome. Did I say it right? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> he is the South African Human Rights uh, Commissioner looking after education in particular. Next to him is Mam Eleanor Sisulu. She is the founder and executive director of Buku Children's Literature Foundation. We're also joined by Professor Michael Sachs. He's the former DDG in the National Treasury. And at the moment, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Witts. He was very sure to say in our panel yesterday, and I don't know if this can come out the panel, but he said to Professor Janssen, it's something very different to being a a junk professor. He's an adjunct <laughs> professor. <laughs> and right here close to me is Unangamso Mzadze. She is the CEO of Fundawande. Thank you so much, panel, for joining us. And now you can start the time, Nick. I'll also start my own time here because I don't want problems and I would love to really open the floor to questions um, when we get to it. The question is, what needs to change for the 2030 goal to be reached and what I'd love for us to achieve as a panel is I think that what the first panel did really well is lay the foundation we've spoken about you know who needs to do what in in, in certain sectors particularly from a society perspective coming together with uh, private organizations and with government as well and for our panel if everybody could leave here with action points actually written down on their own notepad that will be a successful panel to me and I like success. So if you can please, you know, hold hands with me in this juncture, it will be great. Commissioner, I'm going to start with you. And, you know, the right to, to read is a project that you have taken on uh, within the commission. And the question is, why insist on making the right to read and write a human right, putting it in the Constitution as a human right? Kuyamora, uh, good morning, Molweni, the three languages of our region, the Western Cape. Um, yes, the right to a basic education <clears throat> is a fundamental right, but it's a very important fundamental right because it's immediately realizable, which distinguishes it uh, from, for example, the uh, right to education as far as higher education is concerned, which is a progressively realizable right. Uh, and in that context, the whole debate about budget also obviously come into play in the sense that uh, uh, a lot of reprioritization as far as budget has taken place to make free 
higher education, further education and training possible. But uh, therefore, there can be no doubt that the necessary budget specifically for reading and writing uh, needs to be made available because the right to a basic education is immediately realizable. A central component, maybe one of the most central components of the right to a basic education is in the view also of the Human Rights Commission, the right to read and write. Because as all of us know, you learn to read to be able to read to learn, which means that the basis of the education system is basically to learn to read. Otherwise, the, the building is built on a foundation that is not sound. And therefore, in September 2019, and uh, I believe you can find this on the website of the South African Human Rights Commission, we published this document, lots of experts, including Nick Spall and others here uh, today, were involved in uh, putting this document together. It says the right to read and write. And it, it basically was to put emphasis that everyone, every learner actually has an enforceable right to read and write. And what we tried to do in this document was to define what it means to read for meaning by age 10, what needs to be in place, and also which specific building blocks, including resources and so on, need to be in place for this right to be realized. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. You've laid the foundation for us, and I think you, you touch on money and budget, and it, it, it leads us perfectly to the money man, Prof. <laughs> the former money man who knows exactly, you know, more around where money goes, how it's spent, uh, what the challenges are. And there's a saying in Iskosa um, that, that says, and essentially loosely translated is, if you want to know where to go, you need to ask those that have walked the path before you. And in, in, in the report, it speaks about how in Brazil, they, their ability to achieve this goal that we are trying to all get to in 2030 was partly achieved by one political will, but also the fact that municipalities were given incentive to achieve education goals on a municipal level. Is this something that is possible in South Africa? And if so, what's the action plan? What can we do right now? Uh, so I think it's interesting if we, if we reflect back on the presentation that Nick gave us in the morning that on the one hand we have a case study from Brazil that talks about uh, fiscal and financial incentives being the driver in the change. But then we, in the next breath, have a case study of seven successful examples of what changed to cause an improvement in reading. And no mention is made of fiscal or financial issues. Because I think it's important to remember here that what we are trying to do is to transform human relations, to transform relations between teachers and uh, learners in a classroom and in a system uh, of social relations, which is the education system. And finance can play a role in that, but uh, in my view, it's a secondary role. And I think uh, I see Spencer Janari here, who's still in National Treasury, still uh, plugging away at the education budgets. You may want to add to this later. But I, you know, the other maybe contradiction that uh, I raised yesterday in the panel is that, and, and it speaks very much to, I think, the composition of today's audience, which seems to be strongly rooted in philanthropy in the private sector, uh, is that we can say five billion is spent on philanthropy for education, and the only way uh, that money should be used or, or the, the, the primary uh, victory from that money should be to transform the 250 billion government system. I agree with that entirely. But then should we say we must spend 3 billion on reading and this will uh, transform the system of learning and teaching in schools? I don't think that we should be thinking about uh, a budget for reading. 
I mean, we can have programs and budgets for reading. What we really need is a budget for a foundation phase of schooling that achieves and is focused uh, around a system that achieves the reading outcomes. Because the danger is, is that if you approach this problem as though we are eradicating a virus, as though our enemy is some kind of pathology in society, perhaps like HIV and AIDS or coronavirus, we will lose the fact that what we are trying to change here is a system of human relations. And the question to ask for me is what role can financial incentives play in that? One of the financial incentives that is important is uh, the incentives for teachers. Uh. Uh, and so while we may want to add into our, obviously there are particular easy wins that we need to finance, such as the graded readers that uh, Nick spoke about in the morning that we should place into every school and it would make, make sense for that to be financed. But ultimately, how, does, how do we use the finance to leverage a change in human relations, I think, is the important issue. I think this leads us perfectly to you, uh, Mum Eleanor, because if we're talking about the fact that money needs to be channeled into the right places to do the right things at the right time on a large scale and even on a small scale, if we look at the presentation and the report that was given to us, does one not get a sense that there are too many things in too many places and there's a need for some sort of uniformity to come through so that we're able to target the goals and say, these are the five and these are the five programs that we'll do across the country as opposed to this one doing this here, this one doing this there. Do you think that there's a need for uniformity in the sector when it comes to the vision? Well, there is a need for strategic thinking and I think definitely when you say all children reading by the age of 10, it really narrows the target and it gives you opportunities to measure performance, which, which uh, Nick has been emphasizing how important it is. It also makes the focus on the foundation because, you know, reading is like a house. If you don't get the foundation right, the structure will be shaky and you have to then underpin the foundations. And I think now this is what we're trying to do. And so, uh, and, I, and I think politicians tend to focus on, for obvious reasons, higher education. You know, high school children will to toy toy ECD, they're not going to toy toy and burn down buildings and all that, so, uh, <laughs> not yet. Maybe. Yeah, so, so I think that the, the making sure that there's a shift of resources but it's not just money, it's how money is spent. Mm. And I agree with the focus on teachers, how teachers teach, getting that right, that teachers must be able to teach reading. Uh, yesterday there was, uh, I mean, we spoke about the fact that there's no accountability. So putting accountability into the system, removing corruption, and many of the interventions are not to do with reading per se, but the environment. Um, like if you have jobs for, what, what was that scandal, jobs for whatever. But when people are killing each other to put jobs, their mm. own friends in jobs, that kind of corruption, it's, it's the environment which, which uh, environmental factors within the schools, but then also rewarding people who are doing well. And right now in our society, in black communities, especially poverty stricken communities, there's very little award, reward for people who are working around reading. And I want to pay tribute to the artists. I've been focused on teachers. And I think as a society, we need to look at artists, storytellers, people in our indigenous knowledge systems. And I'm very glad you gave the introduction that you did. Because I think for many people in the room, they would have felt that sense of exclusion. And that some of our children feel this ex exclusion daily when they go into the classrooms because the language of, uh, the, when they try, uh, are in an English environment, they, 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 they struggle. Oh. And so, so artists play a role as teachers. And I want to mention Grinam Flope, I want to mention Madosini, mm. Katrina Iso. These are people at community level uh, who really do profound work and maybe the problem is that they are not measured. If, and and I'm, I'm really challenged, Nick, how do you evaluate the work of Trinam Flope? If you say 
there's low energy in the schools. There's lack of curiosity. Uh, Yvonne can testify, if you go to Trina's uh, festivals, which brings together schools from around KZN, you will see the level of energy, you will see the quality of reading. What she has achieved is extraordinary. And what financial reward has she got? Mm. My dream is that one day the Department of Education would recognize such people, say these are teachers, and actually give them a teacher's salary. Yeah. Uh, Katrina Iso is the last mother tongue speaker of the new language. There were 20 in 1994. She's the last one. We have a language going extinct. And this relates to people's identity, people's sense of alienation. Uh, and she has done a lot. We've published the first book in the new language. She's living in very difficult circumstances. And someone like that to be recognized as an expert in new language and given the reward of a teacher's salary at least, being recognized as a teacher, not just an artist or a storyteller. So I think the, 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 the focus on school and teaching is great, but there are many pathways to literacy. Mm. Uh, and I think the, the work of Bualit is quite, really important in the set. Our communities have resources that we have not tapped on. And, and that we need to tap on those resources, but make it possible for the people in those communities mm. to do their work. Uh, make it easier for them. Give them data, for example. Let them be able to acknowledge what they do. Mm. So I think for, for me, the, the, the whole library, art sector, and the role in the culture of reading, I think there's the pedagogy, and there's the education part of it, but there's also the culture part of it that can spark children to be interested. Sure. And I think that's something that must, and that requires a much less investment than schools. Mm. And so I, I, I really would encourage that respect for our languages and inclusion. And, and one thing that COVID has done is give us possibilities to use the digital space much more. There's a much greater uptake. So you can, we had webinars last year in every single language. Uh, at far less of a cost of then bringing people together like this. Mm. So it is possible now, and we need to do this to make this conversation more inclusive. You know, when you speak about the importance of the arts and culture when it comes to reading, I'm reminded when I was still in primary school, and we used to have this traveling show that would come to school called Hooked on Books, and they would literally come and bring books to life, and how that just excited all of us to really want to pick up a book as a child. And as you said, it's an investment of a different kind. It's a teaching of a different kind, but it is still something that contributes to this goal of how do we encourage and really build a society where kids can read uh, for, for meaning by, by the age of 10. Now, I'm gonna come to you and ask you a question that uh, the, the previous uh, chair of the panel stole from my paper. I saw him looking and it, <laughs> it was around, <laughs> all respect, Prof. Uh, it was a question around, if you had to pick one initiative, one intervention that you could scale right now, we have got decision makers that are sitting in philanthropic work who are sitting with a budget saying, what am I doing with my 200 million this year? Where would you say they should put that 200 million? Um, yeah, no, very good question. And also just to, to ad uh, admit, Khulusane, that um, I'm coming from more of a technical nuts and bolts um, perspective. And my general concern in all of this is uh, system, scalable, sustainable solutions. Mm. Um, we know a lot now about reading in African languages than we did 10 years ago. Mm. Um, we've, it's probably not enough, the work is still happening, but I think we're in a far much more uh, better place than we, when, we, uh, when we are. So on that, I mean, I think my, my, if I had budget, I think uh, I would be on the same page as Commissioner, um, only because there is evidence um, that has shown that in the Eastern Cape, being implemented after two years, there's been improvements. But just to add, um, not something else that hasn't been mentioned today is this great opportunity of this dual crisis of unemployed um, youth in South Africa mm. and in improving learning outcomes. So I know that there that are already in place, that are happening, um, but I think really 
strengthening uh, recruitment screening process, uh, putting these uh, uh, TAs or reading champs into a structured programs with the sufficient support in order for them to support teachers, uh, the teachers that they are, the classrooms that they've been placed in. So I think it's anthologies and probably tackling this dual crisis. Because if we don't, um, we, we definitely need to address learning losses to be able to reach our dreams that you go. Uh, I'd love to throw this question to anyone on the panel who, who, who thinks that, that they have the answer to it. And it, it's going to be a bit of a controversial question. And it's around, earlier on, uh, Lindy, where as well as uh, Osis Nongrulego, they were touching on the fact that corporate won't redirect funds into a dysfunctional system. Like, why am I investing in something if I know that the results are not working or I know that the system is not working, rather, and therefore my results are going to be jeopardized? And if we know that political will, serious political will, to change the status quo is required, as we've seen in Brazil, um, as the chairperson referred to yesterday with the Cuba example, is there room for a question around, can a philanthropic group exert pressure of, unless you fix this, we won't be doing that? Or is that too much of a mafia, bullying kind of status quo to say, listen, we know we can exert pressure in certain other places, and we want you to do this focus on this side of reading. I is there room for that? Uh, one is to be diplomatic, of course. But I think if you can prove, prove something at a, a, a local level which is scalable, I mean, like these books, for example, that's, that has been proved. And, and you can then exert pressure to say, we're going to provide so much if you match it with so much. You know, it's quite a straightforward thing. And, and, and you, you say that, you know, this book is translated into all the languages. You're providing a common reading experience. It's a very tangible uh, thing to do. But I, I just think the opportunity where you have teachers retiring and you then have to have train a whole lot of obviously younger people gives an opportunity for because education is transforming globally, digitally. Mm. Mm. So the digital upskilling of teachers, so the fact that you have older teachers retiring and you have younger teachers coming in means that you will have more digitally savvy teachers. And you have to take advantage of the digital space. Mm. And I think if, maybe if I said one thing, that would be, to me is the greatest single opportunity. Because it's also something that is, is in a way independent on, of government, you invest in people uh, who then have access to a world of information, training resources, can learn independently. So I, I think that you, you, you actually don't need to pressure government for anything. Mm. Because those, those people will come to you if you have a program for digital upskilling. And that, that is absolutely urgent and crucial that the more digit, the greater the teacher's digital capacity is, the better. The better. Yeah. I think it ties in with what Unangamso was saying earlier on, that there's such an opportunity with so many young people who are unemployed and the shortage and need for teachers. Surely there's uh, a marriage that can be made there. And in also showing young people that teaching is a profession that you can go to and should aspire to go into, as opposed to just being a famous person or just being a CEO. <laughs> yes? <laughs> You're like, you wanted to add a point there. Yeah. So I think I probably um, uh, would agree with Nick in a sense if you look at the, the, the spread in, in the budget, um, you know, um, that we won't try and change the work, we won't try and change reading outcomes through purely just um, private money. Mm. But I mean, I can only speak from our experience um, as Funawande is that it has allowed us um, to experiment and to explore. Um, with things that do work, things that can work, which I think government, it's slightly tricky in a sense that there's no time now to experiment. To experiment with our money. must deliver now. <laughs> um, so I think, um, I mean, at least from where we're coming from, it's been, it's been sort of um, capitalizing on, on those opportunities. Mm. Most importantly, feeding that back into the system. Um, how does this, you know, uh, contribute to interventions, approaches, debates, and, and, and so forth. And I think the issue of capacity building, um, being young, black, female, I think it's um, also quite crucial. I mean, if you look around in this room, I think, um, not wishing any ill on someone else, but probably in the 
next 40 years, yeah. more than 50% of them won't be, won't be around. So it's, it's a reality. So, um, like Nick said, we are, Nick that, said, that is a fact. Nick said, you're all getting a year older, it's a fact. Yes. <laughs> but who will be the people that will be in these positions that have to make uh, the these, decisions. these decisions? Correct, correct. So, yeah, I think there's opportunities there. Commissioner? Yeah, I want to come back to your question as to the, <coughs> the one thing that must change. Oh. Um, I think in 2008, Nick um, mentioned that, the former Minister of uh, Basic Education, Naledi Pando, published the list of basic resources that should be uh, in every classroom. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and so my one thing would have nine uh, subcategories. Only one of those 10 things published in 2008, the DBE workbooks, has been made nationwide and universally available to every learner. There are nine other specific things that should be made available. One of those is graded readers for every single learner in the foundation phase. Now the usual suspects who do things and get attention normally are Gauteng and the Western Cape. But in 2019 and 2020, Two DDGs were instrumental, they're sitting in this room, in the Eastern Cape, that every learner got a graded reader, these Vula Bula uh, graded readers, in the Eastern Cape. For some other reason, uh, that uh, hasn't happened uh, in, in the subsequent year, uh, and maybe this is, you know, instead of having slogans, instead of having um, pilot projects here and there and 100 schools here and 200 schools there and whatever the case may be, let us at least put a graded reader in the hands of every learner. These books are, are open source. They cost 11 rands to publish per book. 32 million is all that is required for the whole of South Africa to, for every foundation phase learner to have one of these in their hands. Mm. It's available in all, all the home languages. Please, let's start there. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And I think that's a clear action point. There's somebody sitting in this room that has 32 million rand sitting in their CSI budget right now <laughs> who can pick up a phone call and say, I know what we're going to do with the money. And it's no joke. There literally is somebody who can make that movement. And it's something that we can measure in a year's time to say, did we get a book in every child's hand? The answer will be yes. We are progressing. We can do that. So please, WhatsApp who you need to WhatsApp. Make the phone call and let's know by the time we walk out of here that we are for sure getting a book in every child's hand. Uh, I'd love to come to you, uh, Prof, in our last five minutes before we open questions to the floor. And it's a question around what does accountability look like? You know, for me as a young person, it, it's always so disheartening to see people in power and when you do something wrong, whether it's small or big, all you get is a slap on the wrist. But when it has an impact on a child's ability to actually be a positive member of society that contributes to society in the future, I want to know who is being held responsible for not delivery of a book. I want to know who is being held responsible for uh, misappropriated funds and what is the punishment? What can accountability look like and should, what should it look like? I think accountability is a central issue. Sorry, before that, I was going to suggest that maybe, you know, our four recommendations are quite uh, high level and abstract, and maybe we should have a fifth recommendation that is uh, exactly worded like uh, Commissioner has mm. put it as coming mm. out of here. Correct. So we have a very clear thing. Um, so accountability is central to the operation of public systems in particular, but very complicated because I was talking to the, the HOD from Gauteng uh, in the break, and he was saying, you know, he looks to Kuro, like how are they able to do this and deliver uh, infrastructure and schooling and it's growing across the province? And I'm saying, but when somebody is paying you for a service, mm. you have a direct line of accountability between you and that service provider. And you're able to leave that service provider, vote with your feet and go somewhere else. But in the public sector, the resources are collected from taxpayers this side and then delivered to poor 
uh, um, disempowered communities on the other side. So then how do we solve the problem of accountability? We tend to always uh, look upward to some uh, father figure uh, that is going to enforce uh, this accountability on people at the lower levels, mm. whether that be National Treasury or the Hawks or the Auditor General or something. Those institutions are Im important. But the real absence that I think we have in the system is the downward accountability that can never replace uh, those excellent people at the top looking down. We need parents and communities to be empowered to hold their, their, their schools accountable. And that's uh, not an, it's an easy thing to say, but not an easy thing to, to do. do. Thank you so much to our panel. I think that was an exciting and an eye-opening conversation. And truly, I think what I echo what Mary Medkoff said earlier, that may this really be the safe space where we're able to have these honest conversations. It's not always going to be pretty, but we all want the same goal. We all want the same thing. And we're not going to achieve it just as a reading panel. We're going to need you to hold our hands along. We'll get it right, we'll get it wrong. But as I said, we're working towards the same thing. Thank you very much. I'm handing over to Umam Pumzile to share her closing remarks. And then thereafter, I will be heading out. Please follow the team outside. They'll direct you for our group photo. And then it's going to be lunch. I think one of the most important times of the day. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, panel, for a very uh, exciting conversation. We have now come to... Uh, the end of this uh, session. Thank you so much uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm sorry that we couldn't have more of you um, come up and contribute to this conversation. But uh, I'm just asking Nick if people have something that is banning them. They give them two weeks or three weeks to contribute and to send messages. And uh, make sure that uh, we hear what you have to say so that we can put it in the report of uh, this inaugural uh, meeting. I think what has come out today, um, if in case someone doubted, even though I doubt if anyone doubts that in this room, is the importance of teachers. The importance of supporting um, uh, teachers and not only blame them when things go wrong. We have spoken about uh, the pre-service training, which needs to be invigorated because it's not achieving what it is supposed to achieve. Uh, we therefore need universities to work with us. We want to hold hands with universities in order to make sure that we support the transformation that they need. We may want the big transformation of the education system, but we're starting somewhere. And I'm sorry, universities, your heads are in the block. <laughs> we are asking you to lead the change by making sure that the supports that and the preparation that you're giving to the teachers enable the teachers to be our frontline soldiers, which they are, and to make sure that uh, the work that they do gives us the results that uh, we need. We spoke about budgets and money. Uh, while we say money is not everything, but money is something. So something has to give there. It's not only money that has to come from government, but money that comes from government is the money that is the bigger part of the solution. But we too have to make sure that where we can access resources, we have to support what government is doing. We spoke about managing expectations. Uh, we clearly uh, do not think that in 2030, we would absolutely reach the goal uh, that we are uh, exposing now but it is aspirational. We need to get as close to that goal as we can. It's important that we evaluate uh, every year when we meet like this 
so that we can say how far have we come, how far do we still need to go, and we can present a realistic uh, pictures. But I think it's good to start with a bang, uh, to be uh, ambitious. Who knows, someone may find a methodology that would make us move uh, faster, the way technology has. So let's keep our minds open, but I think the point about uh, managing expectation expectations is quite important. We've heard about the 10 things that were presented by Minister Pando, and that only one of those 10 things has been done. I think that one we have to do. Really, that one we have to do. So amongst us, there is a, a person for each thing. Let us divide the nine things amongst ourselves and see how we can make sure that when we meet next year, we can check how far we have come. So if you are going to write to us, please tell us what you can do about one of the nine things. This is not something that is just the responsibility of the department. It is something that we all have to do, even though we look up to the department. Uh, to lead us in this endeavor, but we also have to be there to assist. We've heard that uh, we need a cool 30 million uh, rents uh, for the delivery of the I'm just checking if anyone in this room uh, knows someone who knows someone who has the 32 million rent. So that's... Uh, Pay year, pay year, yeah. So someone can take a year, someone can take another year. Let's think about what we can do uh, with that. And then just the issue of scaling, which Nangamso has been raising over and over again, raising in a sustainable way the work that we do. We have to think about scaling up our work joining up our hands and making sure that we don't reduce ourselves into smaller Nyana projects. This is something that uh, we need someone to help us and to lead us. And again, we would depend on, the, on, the, on DBE because they know the people who are doing stuff everywhere. They can guide us and say, if so and so, got together with us as a department, this is how much we could scale up. So something has to be done about scaling up. But ultimately, because reading is so important, we need to, in this year to 2030, we need to get to a point where we have a seamless scaling up, where we are kukulela ngoko. We are really taking everything and every child. The ecosystem is not where it needs to be. So it's not reading standing alone, it's reading within an ecosystem that is driving. So we need libraries, we need communities, in addition to teachers and what we do inside the classroom, which is the most important space. So if you know the area that you are in and you know how much it fits into the ecosystem, please, say so, so that uh, the, the space that you are in is also uh, given um, a attention. Uh, we also spoke about ECD and about, as we are looking forward, we also want to look back. Where are these children coming from? Who is making sure where, that where the children are coming from, uh, everything is being, uh, addressed and we are making it possible for these kids to jump uh, into their learning years with some uh, background. So we should talk about ECD as uh, much as we can. I see two people at least that uh, we are with in the ECD uh, discussions. Let us make sure that we synergize with um, ECD. Now, this panel is not everything, does not have the resources and the capacity to do everything 
and all that needs to be done. So we'd like to hear from you about what other people can do together or by themselves in order to make this endeavor successful. We will write the reports and try and streamline uh, what we, we think came out of this so that it is possible for you to follow through and to, and to read up. In between, we'll be reaching out to you, most importantly, reaching out to government, uh, supporting and nudging and doing -do sometimes. And uh, we will be reaching out to you to tap on your expertise and we would like you to also raise your hand and say what it is that you can do. But uh, for a modest start, uh, we are happy that this is where we are. We thank you so much uh, for, for coming and we invite you to criticize us, to support us, and to help as much as you can. So thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>